Chairman, Director of UMTREE, Director of the Mobility Transformation Centre. So UMTREE is our host uh, this afternoon, so we're very proud to be hosting you here at this auditorium. Um, great speaker, very interesting guy. I just met Matt for the first time this morning, spent an hour talking to him about automated vehicles. Uh, I wasn't planning to do that. but. Um, so when it comes to the question time, I think you can answer, ask him pretty much anything and he'll give you an interesting answer. Um, our sponsor for this series is the Toyota Motor Company, uh, represented here by Chuck Goulash. So Chuck, thank you again for, your, for Toyota's continuing sponsorship. This is the fourth in our series of seminars. And uh, leadership in transportation. And what a great a juncture to be having a series on that, given all the uh, transformational things that are happening in transportation, and transportation's in the news much, uh, much more than it ever has been before. So we're very excited about that. <coughs> we uh, this is going to follow the traditional old school seminar methodology this afternoon. We're going to have a presentation. Uh, we're going to have a, some questions, and then we're going to have a recept nice reception outside there, so please join us. Um, <clears throat> we've seen a lot of, and I think Umtree's been involved in this, and certainly Iowa's been one of the leaders and some others like uh, Virginia and so on. Um, all these methods for collecting large amounts of data uh, that not only tell us more about uh, the cognitive aspect of driving, uh, but do it in a in much greater depth and whether we call it naturalistic methodology, whether we're using simulators, whether we're using uh, specially created test environments as we've done with the connected vehicles here in Ann Arbor, or whether we're just like Google, we're out in the real world driving our automated vehicles around, figuring out how what kind of situations arise and how we deal with them. So certainly there are many methodologies, there's a huge amount of data able to be collected now, much uh, larger data sets. <coughs> We're very interested in that at Umtree, Matt, and uh, I know you are at Iowa, so cognitive research has never, never been more critical. Um, Francine Romine up the back there is one of the organisers of the series, and Jane Ritter, is Jane, Jane in, the, in the hall? Uh, excellent, and uh, Monica Davis. So I want to thank, please join me in thanking all of them for putting these seminars together. <laughs> so Francine's a great one for doing deals. Um, so you're all guinea pigs here today. We, we've got a deal for you. Uh, on the 21st to 23rd of April, Umtree is hosting the second global symposium on connected and automated vehicles here at the Rackham uh, auditorium here at, in Ann Arbor. And uh, the, the uh, registration for, fee for that off the street is 525 For you today, 300 bucks. <laughs> so come and see, go and see Francine and she'll uh, put, give you a special link to the website and we'll, we'll have a deal for you. I also want to mention the ITS World Congress will be uh, in Detroit September 7 to 11 this year, very exciting with uh, 8 to 10,000 experts from all around the world. This is a huge opportunity for our uh, research institutes and our industries, uh, the MEDC, Michigan DOT and so on, to really put forward um, the leading work that's happening in the future of mobility here in Michigan. So I want to give that a mention as well. Having said all of that, um, our partner in Hosting these, the seminar series is Chuck Goulash from Toyota. He's the director of the CSRC, the Collaborative Safety Research Center. And what a great center it is where uh, some leading university research centers are working on um, what I would describe as more investigator driven research projects than perhaps we normally have the opportunity to do. We're very grateful for that opportunity. And of course, one of the hallmarks of CSRC is open publication and use of the information. So Chuck, we thank you for, for the way you've put that together 
and Chuck is uh, going to introduce our speaker. Please welcome Chuck Goulash. Thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, it is an honor to uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Matt Rizzo, the professor of neurology, engineering, and public policy at uh, University of Iowa. Uh, many different titles, many different uh, um, organizations, director of the Division of Neuroergonomics, uh, vice chair for translational and clinical research in uh, neurology, also the founding director of the uh, Aging Mind and Brain Initiative. And from April 1st, uh, Matt's still going to stay within the Big Ten, but he's uh, you know, going to spend most of his time over at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, he becomes the a professor and chair of the Neurological Sciences uh, Department and the director of the Nebraska Neuroscience Alliance. So, just briefly, you know, Matt's uh, research focus has been cognitive impairments caused by aging and neurological diseases like strokes, uh, Alzheimer's, and traumatic brain injury. Uh, taking this to a more real-world type uh, uh, activity of things like uh, driving. You know, he's led many multidisciplinary uh, research projects uh, looking at the behavioral consequences of neurological disorders, uh, advises the U.S. Army, uh, DOT, uh, many other organizations, uh, part of uh, uh, um, the Academy's uh, committees. Um, but he is also a PI for one of the CSRC projects on uh, the use and impact of uh, in-vehicle technologies for the older driver. Um, Matt was, uh, uh, has degrees from Columbia, Johns Hopkins. His career basically, starting with residency, has been in Iowa. Uh, but if you listen closely, you'll pick up a little bit of a Brooklyn accent because that's where he grew up. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Matt Rizzo. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks, uh, Chuck. Thanks, Dr. Swetman. Thanks, Kazu, Jim. I see a lot of friends in the audience, even colleagues from neurology like Hank Paulson at Iowa, who has defected to Michigan. But uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I feel like I'm at home. So I was going to give a talk today called My Car, the Doctor. I thought that was a very cool talk. But uh, the focus today is going to be on driving simulation. So I'm going to talk about that today. And we've done a lot of that and try and sort of put it in perspective. So this is sort of acknowledging that I am moving on pretty soon. I have to move next week. Not going to be that easy. <laughs> um, and uh, again, I want to thank the CSRC because I think that um, it, there's a lot of foresight in developing multi-institutional collaborations that are related to um, safety across multiple populations using, you know, this in the second most expensive thing that we, that we own and perhaps the most dangerous situations we get into. And so it's great to have safety science and to have support from Toyota. So I want to acknowledge also my key colleagues, Jeff Dawson in biostatistics, Steve Anderson in neuropsychology, Nazan Aksan, multivariate statistics and experimental design, and Joan Severson, who's worked with us quite a lot in developing some of our technologies. So I'll talk a little bit about, I think when you talk about driving, you need to know who's at risk, theory and causality. You need to know about the diseases, drugs. It's important to consider, how do we measure driving? What is driving? Then simulation. How can we get at issues in the real world from simulation? How can we assess the validity of simulated results? Do they represent what we think that they represent? How do they relate to what's going on in the real world measured with other techniques like using instrumented vehicles? Or even putting sensor devices in people's own cars, so-called black boxes, like you would have on, say, that Malaysia plane that crashed the other day. And then we'll talk about new directions. So on the face of it, vehicle crashes are very important. You have essentially a medium-sized plane crashing every day. 
even though there has been some reduction in uh, crash deaths recently. Crashes are very expensive. Uh, there are a, a million of them, a million fatalities or more across the world every year. So if we take a global view, this is a really critical problem, and it's one that we can't ignore. So what's the chain of causality? Well, for those of us in medicine, we have people who have declining powers. They have waning abilities. They have diseases that cause impairments in cognition. And those result in changes in behavior. And the changes in behavior may sometimes result in safety errors and sometimes in the presence of a, a risk resulting in crashes. So you'd think that, well, maybe we'll study crashes and we'll figure out all about what's going on. And, but it's not so easy because clash, crashes are not that frequent. They're all too frequent from a public health perspective, but from a statistical perspective, they're pretty rare. They follow a distribution called the Poisson distribution. Um, they're essentially black swans, and they're really hard to predict. So we have to be able to predict them from surrogate measures, like errors that people make before they make a crash, and that's really where we want to intervene. Here's another way. Well, okay. So here's a look at <clears throat> a framework for looking at weaknesses in uh, functional domains that may lead to errors that cause crashes. In our patients, and even in aging populations without necessarily disease, that can be trouble with perceiving, attending, and interpreting a stimulus, maybe because of macular degeneration, or cataract, or a bad prescription for lenses. There can be executive dysfunction, maybe in somebody who's got incipient Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment or Parkinson's disease. There can be people who have uh, trouble with a motor dysfunction where executive functions in a plan are intact, but the, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, as in somebody with a neuropathy or multiple sclerosis or motor components of Parkinson's disease. People with memory disorders may not have the ability with short-term working memory problems to recall the locations of vehicles around them, why they got in the car, uh, the procedures that they should follow automatically when they get into a, a high-risk situation. So when the outcomes of behavior don't match expectations, that provides feedback that you should make a change. Executive functions and self-awareness help you to make a correction that will allow you to be safe but people who have anosognosia, who, who are unaware of their impairment, who are unaware of their disease, may fail to self-correct and consequently be at, more at risk. So our patients and us, when we're sleepy or we've taken, a, say, an antihistamine or for some other reason, are at risk at multiple points in this framework. And so understanding where people go wrong can help us to mitigate crash risk. So what we want to be able to do is to relate these sort of tip of the iceberg events, the ones that are infrequent but highly visible, though the kind of fatal crashes you read about in the newspaper every day, with these sort of below the waterline, this is a thing called Heinrich's Triangle from industrial engineering, these highly frequent low severity errors or behaviors that we all demonstrate, like failing to adjust seat belts or mirrors. So Figuring out the relationships between these different events in the triangle is one of the essences of safety research. There are other ways of looking at this, say from a systems perspective. Another model is the so-called Swiss cheese model of reason, where you have Emmentaler or Swiss cheese, and the slices are safety barriers, the holes are weaknesses, and they're constantly shifting. And when these holes align momentarily, uh, a hazard can pass through. That's when systemic failure occurs. So the, uh, the idea, in a, a metaphorical sense, is to add slices to improve safety, as in crew resource, ma cre re crew resource management that many of you in the audience will be familiar with, for example, in airline safety. Uh, and this model actually fits into mathematical theories like percolation theory. Another way of looking at this, and we actually discussed this at Toyota today, is from a policy perspective as to where to intervene. So this is a thing called Haddon Matrix, and you have human factors, vehicle and equipment factors, physical environment factors, and social and economic factors. And you have pre-crash, 
crash and post-crash uh, uh, sections on the timeline. And the question is, where are we working? So if you're in medicine, maybe you're working here. If you're designing vehicles, maybe you're working here. Maybe you're working a little bit in the social and economic and helping to make policy. If you're NHTSA, maybe you're working over here. So we're all working on different parts of these cells, all of us trying to work together to make the system safer. So who are we trying to make it safer for? For all of us, but some people are at greater risk than others. Everyone's familiar with the younger driver, hasn't acquired the skills of the road, maybe is distracted by colleagues in the car, maybe he's using the cell phone. There's the older driver too, and so there's sort of a U-shaped curve. Very risky, you know, in teenage years, the risk uh, is mitigated by about 25. Very safe up to here, and then there's a question of older driver safety. Age is a surrogate for a lot of stuff that's happening. Those impairments that I mentioned to you before, of vision and uh, cognition and mobility, um, the older you get, the more likely you are to have those kind of defects alone or in combination. Well, we also put ourselves at risk, don't we? we? We drink and we drive or we take medications and we drive. And this is a thing called the Borkenstein curve. And it's been used to help, the little circles are off a little bit here, to determine how high is the level of alcohol in your blood in terms of milligrams per deciliter that puts you at legal risk for a crash. So generally in Europe, it's 0.5 milligrams per deciliter. In the US now, it's 0.8 milligrams per deciliter. But, but it's highly variable about how people respond with these levels of alcohol in their blood. Then we have all kinds of diseases that put you at risk. Cervical arthritis, you can't turn your neck to look in the mirrors. Encephalopathy, which is a garbage bag term for any, term for any disorder of the brain. Could be from a neurodegenerative disorder. Could be from having kidney problems or, or liver problems. Medications, vestibular disease, sleep disorders, falling asleep at the wheel. All of these are risk factors in driving. So linking the disease and the severity of disease to likelihood of crash risk has not been that easy. easy. And it's not there, that there's evidence of absence. It's that there's absence of evidence. And many of the studies that have been performed in, for these different diseases have been done in different ways with different outcome measures. And lumping them together is very difficult. But here's an example of a meta-analysis uh, that was performed for the FMCSA about five years ago showing that the relative risk of driving with diabetes is maybe 20% higher than it is in the general population without diabetes. Why is that? Is it because blood sugar is going down in relation to insulin in people with type 1 diabetes? Is it because in type 2 diabetics, uh, these are people who are overweight who also have sleep apnea or also on multiple medications? Nobody knows. So it's terra incognita and a ripe area for research. Parkinson's disease is another area for research. I'm just giving it as an example. There are many diseases that we should be investigating. There are motor impairments that everyone knows about, but also cognitive, visual, sleep problems, psychiatric. And these are all important, and we've done a number of studies on this disease. Then there's the issue of drugs and driving. You'd think that there would be a lot of good evidence to show how drugs are linked to driving, but there's not. It's a more of a case of absence of evidence. But here's a case where a drug has been linked to uh, driving uh, problems, and that's with benzodiazepines, and that's not a surprise. So, you know, when you have a person who's using these kinds of drugs, you have to be able to advise them, and we don't have good information to advise them. Questions would be like these. Does illicit use of a prescribed Schedule II drug increase the risk of a vehicle crash? Does it negatively impact indirect measures of driver ability. What's the correlation between drug level and the risk for a crash? Uh, what's the correlation between a surrogate measure, uh, drug level and surrogate uh, measures of driving ability, and so forth? We can't answer these questions very easily, and the studies need to be done. And there are all kinds of drugs that all of us take a lot of the time, and some people take multiple drugs. They can be anti antibiotics. Uh, anticholinergics, anti-epileptics, cardiac drugs, uh, ulcer drugs, immunosuppressive drugs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Again, uh, plenty of substrate for research. There are 
illicit drugs, and maybe some of them are becoming licit, like marijuana. Is this something that the FDA is going to want to be regulating soon? Then, are there drugs that actually make driving better? So there are so-called nootropic agents. They include stimulants. Uh, they include uh, uh, pheromones, neuroactive steroids, mood-altering agents. So maybe actually some drugs make driving better. And what we want to know is what are the dose response curves and the temporal characteristics. How much, how, co how adherent does a person have to be with drug therapy in order to improve their driving level maximally? Does the amount of improvement depend on the severity of disease? How many doses of a drug and how regularly do you have to take them in order to have a maximal improvement in driving? After how many doses that you miss, does your driving become unsafe? Again, all unknown. So, what we want to do is have a performance-based approach, and we have to ask the question, how do we measure driving? So there are lots of ways of measuring driving. I think Dr. Swetman alluded to. And you go from the wriggling worm under the microscope of having very tight control, but actually pretty low fidelity, like paper and pencil tests, neuropsychology tests, all the way up through computer-based tests, low-level simulation, interactive simulation, on-road evaluation by a driving evaluator or in an instrumented car, to naturalistic driving of a person in their own environment, on their own uh, account, uh, over extended time frames, where this is the real deal, but there's no control at all, and you have to sift through mountains and oceans of data in order to get events of interest. <laughs> So what we want to do is to triangulate in on people and look at the relationships between different sources of data, driving simulator, instrumented vehicle, and naturalistic, and look at the relationship among these different platforms. Typically, an off-road battery are tests of motor function, cognitive, visual, psychiatric, and sleep. Uh, one can have experimental drives in a driving simulator or an instrumented vehicle. Then there's real life, and that includes naturalistic driving and things from the state record, including crashes, citations, and driving cessation. Also, what the patient tells you, but by the way, don't believe it. And also, what the patient's family tells you, believe it a little more, but these are typically people who are not expert um, observers, but they, they can be very helpful. So this, these are pictures of the approaches that we have at Iowa. This is a, our uh, sort of fixed-based driving simulator. Here's the National Advanced Driving Simulator. Here's a picture of one of our collaborators. This is Jeff Dawson, whose name I mentioned before, um, in an instrumented vehicle. So the results using driving simulators and instrumented vehicles can specify linkages between driver vision, cognition, motor control, physiology, safety errors, and crash risk, and provide evidence for development of counter, countermeasures. Not everyone needs to use the biggest simulator. We need the right tools for the right job. So then we finally get to driving simulation. And so this is measuring behavior safely and in context. So the difference between simulation and a neuropsychological test, which in my mind driving simulation is, kind of, is that it's much more complicated, and it has much more face validity in terms of what it's measuring. So we're in good company. Does anybody know who Francis Bacon is? I mean, this guy is the father of the scientific method. And he had something to say about simulation. He said simulation in the affirmative, which hopefully is what we're talking about today, is when a man industriously and expressly feigns and pretends. So we're faking people out with simulation. It is, a sh it is a good, shrewd proverb of the Spaniard. Tell a lie and find a truth by simulation. So we're telling a lie, in a sense, with simulation, and hopefully we're getting at the truth. So we're in good company. And even better, we have the holodeck from Star Trek. This is from the new generation, which ran for about seven years. And in the very first episode, the holodeck was, was introduced. And so this sort of popularized the idea of VR tools, and these range from surrealistic gaming to caves to fully immersive head-mounted displays. And there are synthetic environments, and they can be used for training, treating, and augmenting human performance. 
So we're using the simulator. We primarily use one that we're proud of. We've got a lot of mileage out of it, even though it doesn't go anywhere. It's in a hospital, and it's the siren simulator, and we've used it in medical cohorts like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MCI, stroke, traumatic brain injury, obstructive sleep apnea, neuropathy, and other diseases. We've used it to evaluate effects of drugs like marijuana, people actually smoking, people using ecstasy or MDMA, alcohol, antihistamines. We've used it to evaluate safety and usability of prototype autom uh, automotive technologies, much as Chuck mentioned. Um, and so by understanding the patterns and mechanisms of errors that cause crashes, we might be able to design interventions that can improve safety. And so the output is multidimensional. We have output from the steering wheel, the pedals, we have lateral and longitudinal, longitudinal position, velocity and acceleration, headway, time to contact, speed. The data are digitized at 30 hertz, so we have a very rich, dense data set. And here are the lies that we tell. Here's one lie. This is an intersection incursion. The uh, ploy here is that the driver D is following behind a lead vehicle A. Lead vehicle gets to the intersection. The driver would assume that he could get through, but a driver incurs, creating the potential for a crash that can be avoided. It depends on how situation aware you are and what your abilities are. So here's an example of what these kind of situations look like. Oh, it's not running. Seems to not be happy. I can't explain it. If the audio is lagging. That's okay. I'm going to try that again. Oh my God! AV guy, can you explain? Oh my god, look at that red truck behind me. <laughs> oh! You can go ahead and continue. That's Somehow fine. the video is not running, but uh, the audio is running. I was waiting for that red truck to do something. Yeah. So this was a late. Oh video. my god. What are we going to do? I'm going to try that again because it's actually a fun video and it's worth showing. I was waiting for that red truck to do something. Yeah. So what you had here was a car oh being followed God. behind that car and being pressured by it. What and are we going to do? Coming to a stop sign with a car that was stopped and she had to go around it. So she, she didn't fare very well. This is a lady with Alzheimer's disease who's driving is avoiding a crash at an intersection. You stupid! So she avoided it, but she wasn't very happy about it. Well, that was my first mistake. I should have slammed on my brakes and put them. These are Iowans. This is put how myself talk. in the side of the car. This is actually a video of a guy with herpes simplex encephalitis who has very severe oh. working memory oh. impairments, who had good <laughs> situation awareness but was unable to respond in time, even though he had. Awareness of a vehicle because Shit. of his executive dysfunction. This next guy is another guy with herpes encephalitis and uh, executive dysfunction who is, avoids a crash. You stupid son of a bitch! Get the fuck off my road! He's very disinhibited. I wish you could have seen that video. Maybe some other ones will work. So, uh, you know. So this is a picture of a guy who has a left occipital uh, injury from falling off of a mo motorbike. He has a right homonymous hemianopia. He does not notice a car incurring from the right and crashes into it at, at highway speed. So this is an example of an application of somebody with brain damage and visual dysfunction uh, in simulation. It's safe to do it in simulation. It wouldn't be safe to take this guy out on the road. So, here is a schematic. So I said we had to develop different scenarios. We have to be able to plot them out and to recover outcome metrics from them. So this is an example of plotting out a rear-end collision avoidance scenario. 
This is an example of kind of a crash plot or a crashogram that comes from our analyses of the electronic and video data from, um, from the tapes that you would have seen had they worked properly. But you can see the scale drawing of the road. You can see the driver's control over the speed and accelerator pedal and brake pedal. So the response is very late. Um, there's some swerving to get out of the way, but it results in a crash at very high speed, you know, 70 miles an hour into an oncoming vehicle. And the skull and crossbones indicates probably would have been fatal in the real world. But the beauty of simulation is nobody gets hurt. Here's another example of a common pattern that we see where somebody is distracted or impaired and they have a crash and they don't do anything and it's kind of like looking but not seeing. And the more we do work in simulation and the more data that we look at, I'm quite convinced that many people never know what hit them. You know, they're up there with wings looking down and how did I get here? Here's an example of another uh, useful scenario, and this is more complicated, and it's a driver response to an emergency vehicle. You know that uh, occasionally you'll see a police car or some other vehicle pulled over by the side of the road. The thing you should generally do, and the law usually says you should pull over to the other lane if possible and slow down. So we actually had an opportunity to look at people with impairments responding to these kinds of challenges, and we wrote a paper called Stops for Cops. We had some patients with Alzheimer's disease who were so flustered by the situation that they stopped their car in the middle of the simulator uh, scenario. See if this video works here. Looks like we're going to have trouble with videos. Yeah, well, what you would have seen here, and I, I don't know why this is, is this is actually from the CSRC scenario, and what you would have seen is a driver going along. It's sort of a vigilance scenario, and you would have seen this green dot moving around to points of regard, reflecting eye movements while driving. Any insights on why we're not seeing videos now? To the not working mode. <laughs> Okay. So, all right. We'll just hit the. Still no go. All right. Well, we'll go back to the other mode. I can actually control that. We'll 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 work with it. Any questions in the meantime? Everything's perfectly clear. Yeah, sure. Um, Matt, right at the beginning, you showed that you know, the CAPTA curve to be yeah. uh, risk. And I'm not sure it was really clear that that was a fatality risk, but that's not the risk per driver. Actually, older drivers, as you know, have a much lower risk of crashing in general. So the safest driver is on the Yeah, I know. So you, one needs to factor in exposure, so you know, risk per mile. So they might be maybe not having as many crashes because they don't get on the road as often. And maybe some of them self-restrict and that's good, but maybe, maybe some of them don't. And it also turns out that some people who restrict may not restrict enough, so they get into trouble. So it's a, mount, a, mount, so it's a question of looking at a risk per mile, and that, that's not so clear, actually, because we don't have good data on how many miles these people drive. But maybe naturalistic studies that actually have GPS uh, and uh, uh, recording from sensors in people's own cars will give us more information on that. So I think that's work in progress. And I think that what you're getting at is that older people are slighted and picked on, and there does seem to be some literature that's supporting that. So that last scenario that I showed you got at vigilance and it looked at eye movements, and there are ways of applying engineering principles uh, like control theory to study driver behavior. And here's an example of that. And this comes from our collaboration with John Anderson. 
um, who uh, did something clever. What he did was to add together three sinusoids to control the speed of a lead vehicle so that effectively the speed changed erratically and unpredictably to the driver, which is our driver. And we use this sort of vigilance scenario in a, a, s different populations. One was we looked at a risky car following and abstinent users of MDMA. The idea is that maybe MDA has some effect on the brain, maybe affects executive function and changes behavior. What we found essentially was that the drivers who used MDMA actually were as good at car following as the drivers who did not, but they actually followed a lot closer behind, and maybe that would be reflective of their tendency to take risks that led them to take a drug in the first place. And in another study of older versus younger drivers, we found that the older drivers were less able to match the velocity change, they lagged further behind, and they drove slower, uh, which is a potential strategy to reduce crash risk. It's a good thing. So that's another example of a scenario that you can use in simulation in medical populations. Well, you can use a simulator to test collision alerting and warning systems and response. And this was the topic of an NIH grant that we had on in-car technology to alert attention-impaired drivers. Uh, we used auditory warnings, haptic warnings, and visual warnings alone or in combination. We found the visual warnings were not that helpful in people who were already impaired because they had uh, driving risks on account of impairments of the useful field of view. They already had um, visual processing impairments that precluded their ability to use visual warnings effectively. They did better with auditory and haptic warnings. This is just a basic study to show, it's basically a physiology of a motor control to show that Drivers exposed to simulators can actually adapt very quickly. So this shows sort of the variability of steering. And then within about 120 seconds in our car, which is not really a car, it's a car for a simulator, people adapt pretty well and can control it pretty well, which is reassuring. It's that this car, which is not their car, they can control. This is what we want to be able to see. Here's an example of an application of um, simulation to study a disease. So one disease that affects driving, and it's kind of an enriched sample for drowsy driving, is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, where people go to sleep at night on, owing to lax tissues in their throat, their airway collapses, they wake up a lot of times, they have hypoxia, which over a long time might actually be causing damage to cells in the brain and affecting performance further. So the question is, does treating the sleep apnea with positive airway pressure not only improve sleep, but improve function? And how does adherence to therapy improve driving performance in the real world over time? So this is a study that we're doing now. And this is another study where a meta-analysis by the FMCSA showed that, yes, Obstructive sleep apnea really is a problem, and it really is worth studying. It's worth studying from an epidemiologic perspective. When you look at truckers, a lot of them are over 50, they're overweight, they have metabolic syndrome, a lot of them have sleep apnea, and the relative risk of a crash is about, you know, 2.72 in obstructive sleep apnea. So this is an important problem. These are people who are sort of at baseline drowsy drivers. And this is an example of a frame from somebody driving in a driving simulator who has sleep apnea. And that was the same simulator that I showed you. And this is what she looks like sort of as she's about to have a micro sleep. And I'm assuming that this video is not going to work. Well, what you would see is this lady would have a head nod. OK, and so and going along with that head nod would be a micro sleep, so you can actually hook up all kinds of physiology equipment to people who have diseases in controlled situations in a hospital. And this is, lady had a, a electrodes on, and this is drop out of the alpha rhythms for five seconds from the back part of the brain, compatible with a microsleep. 
Sleep is a process. It develops gradually. You have more microsleeps. And then finally, the person falls asleep. But the brain shuts down slowly, and it's important to be able to detect this. And this might be able to drive uh, collision alerting and warning systems, driver assist systems, if you would be able to use these kind of systems in a real car, in the real world. There are a lot of technical factors that prevent that at present, but we, we have to look ahead. We can measure vigilance in drivers with obstructive sleep apnea, which we did by, by presenting targets unpredictably at different locations up to 62 and a half degrees out from either side of fixation and measuring response time of false positives and false negatives and applying signal detection theory. And we found that in sleep apnea compared to controls, the ability to respond to these targets, particularly the peripheral ones, declined over a drive compatible with shutting in of the useful field of view. More examples of simulation. Well, you don't have to have something that necessarily looks like being in a car to replicate aspects of driving. One example is a, a study that we did with um, John Anderson again. And what we did was to look at collision detection. We, had, we varied the number of targets coming toward a driver. Uh, and you know when a target is going to hit you, uh, targets that are not going to hit you translate to the right or to the left. Targets that will hit you don't. And so what we did was to vary the number of targets and the preview time. We made them stop before they got to uh, the driver at different times to collision. And we were able to show differences in uh, collision detection in people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's compared to controls without the diseases. So not quite driving simulation, but in a way it is. Same thing here. This comes from Warren. This is sort of the Gibsonian idea of uh, heading from optical flow. And what the driver has to do is to stay in this vector field that's shifting around to go toward a post. And what we did was to show that uh, there were impaired perception of self-motion in abstinent ecstasy and marijuana users. So not quite, a, not quite a driving simulator, but we all have heading from optical flow cues as we drive in the real world. And so not being able to do this is a potential risk for crashing. We've had the most absurd kind of um, displays that maybe we could pass off as driving simulators. Here's an early version of we had the Venus de Milo um, moving in front of the driver. Who uh, This is sort of like a lead vehicle going through these gates that opened and closed, which uh, presented a go, no go scenario. And hopefully this works. No. Oh, well. So we actually were able to in investigate this um, go, no go situation in surrealistic uh, manner to people with various brain lesions. This is a 3D uh, representation of uh, a reconstruction of a brain showing a lesion in the frontal lobe here. And we were able to show defects and go, no go performance in these people with executive dysfunction. Another scenario that you can use is a change detection paradigm. So this is not, this only involves projection of pictures, one to the next. And you can see that what's happened here is a car has appeared in front of the driver and not recognizing that would be a potential risk for a crash. This is something that we published on perception of change blindness, aging, and cognition a few years ago. You can combine simulation with all kinds of physiologic measures that tell you about the state of a driver. And those include body temperature measures, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, GSR, uh, electroencephalographic activity like I just showed you, EMG, uh, gastric activity like an electrogastrogram, um, eyelid closure as an index of uh, alertness and arousal, eye movements and other motor control measures, oximetry, transcranial Doppler sonography, uh, NIRS, uh, blood serum measurements of metabolites, cerebral metabolic activity. You can't really do a PET scan or an fMRI in someone in a simulator, but you can present a low fidelity simulation that's as if you were driving, as, for example, Marcel Just has done, uh, and get information that's rele relevant to how 
different parts of the brain function during different aspects of driving. Uh, you can combine a driving with the human brain lesion method, and I'll show something on that in just a minute. So this is an example of GSR in somebody who's confronted with a threat, which is a dog running across the road, and you can see that they have a GSR response into the dog. So there's another example of physiology in the simulator. Here's an example of measuring driver state, which maybe could be construed as physiology. Maybe it depends on arousal. Maybe it depends on level of anxiety. This is basically a butt print in a seat from sensors in a seat in somebody driving in the simulator. And these are the ischial tuberosities here, which are on the bottom of the pelvis. Let me just show you an example here of combining <clears throat> the human lesion method and physiology with driving. So what we were interested in here is the effects of social pressure on driving. Now sometimes you've got somebody behind you, and he's a jerk, and he's honking a lot, and you have to decide, do I go? Do I go because this guy's behind me and I'm afraid of him? Or do I stay because I'm afraid that the gap between the cars that are oncoming aren't, aren't sufficient for me to actually turn through? So what we found here was that drivers with lesions of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and this comes from uh, registry of subjects with brain lesions in areas of interest or with disorders of interest from the University of Iowa, um, have a skin conductance response, and that they generate a kin skin conductance response like normals in response to a threat, but the skin conductance response persists, and what they actually do is to turn prematurely, putting them at risk and taking shorter gaps to get through compared to controls. So it shows that the inference that we would make is that they have some difficulty controlling social cognition under pressure, and maybe this fits with existing theories of the frontal lobe and its contributions to social cognition. So you can see this is where driving and driving simulation merge with neuroscience and uh, neurological disorders. So that's kind of interesting. So we can also use driving simulation to evaluate systems like augmented reality systems. This is, these are experiments with Michelle Rush and Mark Shaw where we presented different kinds of augmented reality cues projected into the real world to assist drivers with left turn decisions. And we're actually able to show that these kinds of augmented reality cues were accepted by older drivers, didn't cause undue distraction, didn't impair ability to respond, and actually these older drivers accrued the same benefits as younger drivers. So that was something that we learned from simulation. So we actually thought a lot about simulation. We have a handbook out on it. And what is eminently clear is that simulation differs from real world driving. It's a lie. It's a ploy. We hope it relates to what happens in the real world. But there are likely to be differences. So how can we evaluate the validity of simulation? Well, so here are some key points. One of them is simulation has grown and simulators have become more ubiquitous. So have the number of scenarios and outcome measures. The application and interpretation can be pretty tricky. People respond differently in the presence of uh, real world risk than they do in a simulator where nothing's really going to happen to them. Um, Newer tests in simulators haven't really been validated or compared to real world outcomes to the extent that they need to be. Data are needed on sensitivity, specificity, diagnostic impact, therapeutic impact uh, related to simulation. And research is needed to identify new simulator applications, procedures, and user guidelines for both human factors and medical research. So I don't know how many of you have had courses in experimental design but you've probably thought about validity, and validity is really complicated. It's a multi-dimensional construct. There's criterion validity, there's content validity, there's phase validity, there's construct validity, there's incremental validity, there's ecological validity. And if you don't know what they are, criterion validity is the extent a test instrument correlates with an external criterion, uh, like a gold standard. Content validity is the degree an instrument represents the domain of content for the construct of interest. 
Face validity is, you know, does it make sense? Does it measure what it appears uh, to measure? Construct validity is the extent the measure is consistent with theoretically derived hypotheses on associations between the construct of interest, another assumed related and unrelated constructs. Incremental validity is added value. How much novel information do you get beyond what's, what you're getting now from standard measures? And then ecological validity is the extent a measure reflects or predicts an individual's functioning in real, real world contexts and tests. So what can we compare simulation to? Well, we can compare it to road test outcomes, to neuropsychological test scores, as I mentioned before, state record of crashes and moving violations, outcomes in instrumented vehicles, naturalistic driving, personal reports, family reports, and other simulator outcomes. None of those measures, by the way, is perfect. So for example, if you think about reported at-fault crashes from a patient above baseline, it's valid. People don't usually tell you they've had a crash if they haven't, but it's insensitive because people will cover it up. Um, license revocation by statute, that's valid de facto, but it's insensitive because there are people out there driving who should have their licenses revoked and don't. You see them every day, probably. Um, there's driving privileges revoked by a family member, probably valid, you know, the son who takes the keys away from dad, but it's insensitive. Self-surrender of license, probably valid, but very insensitive. There are a lot of people who are not good drivers who want to keep driving, and they do. Failed on a road test by a blinded professional examiner, examiner using statutory criteria, the gold standard. Failed an on-road driving test by a blind professional using validated research criteria, probably also valid and sensitive. Failed in an instrumented vehicle, like the kind of tests we're giving, arguably valid, maybe more sensitive, owing to different kinds of data we get that a driving evaluator doesn't. Failed research criteria using a driving simulator, well, maybe less valid and has unknown sensitivity. This is a comparison between different uh, types of uh, sources of driving information. This is published from the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association from 2011. You can look it up. I, I was the uh, author on this. So instrumented vehicles. I want to mention a little bit about them, and I want to mention a little bit about naturalistic driving before we wrap up. So interest, instrumented vehicles are naturalistic observations, the measuring behavior in transit, and they're in the real world. So here's an example of one such vehicle that we use. And we can actually have people drive around using ploys similar to the ones that we use in a simulator. We're obviously more restricted. We can't be testing collisions. But we can test people with a variety of brain lesions, like in this PET scan. There's this activity that's reduced posteriorly in somebody with Alzheimer's disease or in this person with traumatic brain injury. We can put these people on the road as long as they're legally licensed and still driving, and compare their performance on the road with their performance in the simulator. We can test things like route finding, traffic entry judgment, sign and landmark identification, multitasking, response to a simulated emergency vehicle, a simulated emergency. And I would love to have shown you what this showed. I don't know why I can't. But this would have shown this guy who is route finding, who gets lost, and as a result of getting lost, he becomes flustered and makes an error. And he happens to have a neurodegenerative impairment. And we're able to test him safely on the road and learn from his performance, much as we would have in the simulator. This is an example of looking at the differential effects of distracted driving in older versus younger drivers. And what we did was to look at control over the pedals. And it turns out that when your attention is, dis is diverted by another task, you may actually not make as many changes over the controls as you need to to maintain the vehicle at proper speed or in proper lane position. So this is looking at something called pedal hold time. And the pedal hold time here is longer in older drivers compared to younger drivers who are in a multitasking 
a situation where we had them do a task called the PASAT in the real world, on the road, and we did it safely. So we can compare these kind of results with results in the simulator. This is This is that you will hear a list of serial numbers read one after the other. I want you to add the numbers in pairs so, this is the so that each number is added to the one just is the before one it, the not road. to your answer. It's really simple, add the second number to really the first, hard, and the it's third really to useful. the second, and so on. Now try it with these numbers. Try these. Three. Four. So add three and four. Remember one, the sum and add one to that and so forth. Seven. Two. Four, nine. So, you know, it would seem to be easy, but it's actually hard. It divides your attention from the road, so you have to do the task and maintain control of the vehicle. With normal supervisory control of attention, you turn your attention to the task that's most safety critical, which is driving. So you may see low, lower performance on the PASAT task. For comparison, we have the performance in the laboratory when they're not driving. So we know how much worse they do on the secondary task. Plus, we can tell whether they're engaged in the secondary task based on how they're performing it and how much that affects their driving on the road. This is different from talking on a cell phone in that we actually know that somebody is engaged and not zoning out. So we can tell that they're actually having their attention divided. Of course, adding two numbers together is very different from you're going to have a what? You know, so the emotional content is not there compared to a cell phone conversation. So let me just mention that I mentioned before that what's important is to look at the cross-platform comparisons and look at how do impairments in cognition or impairments in a simulator predict impairments out on the road. And this is a pretty large study. I think it's the largest one to date, and it's one that we did. It's 345 subjects. They have no neurological disease or neurological disease, including Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or stroke. And what we did is to look at performance on different off-road tasks, those paper and pencil neuropsychology tasks, and to cluster them together in domains and see how those domains actually predicted performance in the real world, which were errors in an instrumented vehicle graded by a driving evaluator. And we found that tests of visual sensory functioning, tests of speed of processing and motor and cognitive function, tests of visual spatial construction, and tests of memory were all useful in predicting real world errors. And what we also discovered here is there's no one particular test that's better than any one, than any other particular test. You don't have to use the useful field of view. You don't have to use the Ray Osterite complex figure test. As long as you have a test in that domain, it's probably about as good as other tests in that domain. And you can, use, you can mix and match these tests. You can use the tests that you're most comfortable using in your laboratory or in your clinic. So I will go through this. One other option you have in testing driving are event recorders and black boxes. And this is actually naturalistic driving in the driver's own vehicle over extended time frames. What comes in here is the issue of self-regulation. So when you have somebody who's operating in your laboratory, they're doing it on your own terms. You're asking them to do something. They're not doing it on their own time frame. They're not exposing themselves to danger that they would, that they would expose them, themselves to. Self-awareness is impaired in people with different diseases that we see. Uh, in people who have sleepiness, depression, who take drugs and alcohol, who have neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. I can't tell you how many times a patient like that has come into the clinic and I ask them, are you a good driver? And they say, yeah. And then the relatives are behind them going, no, no. Don't you remember when you ran over you know, Timmy's bicycle when you backed out of the driveway? So some patients lack awareness of situation and self, including their own impairments. Uh, healthy and impaired people forget when they're reporting to you. Some are poor observers. And some of them don't tell you the truth because they have, you know, they think they're going to lose their license. 
The bottom line is trust people, but verify. And you can do that with naturalistic driving. The crowd will move into the congressional so, so going along the line of deliver that message personally to their own lawmakers. Lisa? Thanks, Mike. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Quit on it? Okay. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> Let me see. Wow. Well, I'm not sure what's going on here. No problem. It's not, it's not updating off of your regular file. I don't, I don't know what. Miracle. That's why you're the boss. <laughs> okay, so this is an example of a recording of somebody who has traumatic brain injury, and it's from a standard thing called a drive cam, and, it's, and what it is is it's, it's recording triggered clips from, the cloud will move from the exceedances. Building, so and the lady the here is, personally, she's going to respond to a truck that's suddenly oh, pulling in her way, and so she jerks her car, and there's an accelerometer exceedance, and we can record it and evaluate it to see that she made a proper response to a threat as opposed to having an error. So video validation is critical. I am going to skip through these just because I want to show you. So I mentioned sleep apnea before as a problem. I mentioned that video validation is important. I mentioned that there can be triggering of the clips from exceedances, like from an accelerometer in the vehicle. But it's also important to look at baseline videos to see what's the frequency of behaviors that are at-risk behaviors, like looking drowsy or falling asleep in the absence of an exceedance. This is important because it's also risky. And I hopefully will be able to show that here. All right, so this is from an ongoing study of ours of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And you can see that this guy is, this is a view he sees out the front of his uh, mirror. This is from an NIH grant. You can see the guy is practically asleep. And so his kid is asleep. Everybody in the car is asleep. But nothing happens. They must be in a Google car. So it's possible to get these kind of data. It's possible to get these data over extended time frames. It's possible to compare these data with instrumented vehicle data, driving on your course, and with simulator data, and with neuropsychology data like the data that I presented. So Chuck, you asked before about actigraphy data, so we could actually get a real world sleep in these people to see what's the re relationship between the sleep they got, the adherence to their PAP regimen, and they're driving. So this is sleep monitored with actigraphy for a week. The yellow is activity. Uh, the uh, bluish areas here are nighttime when the lights are out. And you can see there's less activity. And you can see this is actigraphy before and after treatment with positive airway pressure. So positive airway pressure opens up the lax airway. You wear a mask. It opens it up. Presumably, you sleep better at night as long as you're adherent to it. People aren't adherent to it because it dries them out. They feel claustrophobic. They get gas. They roll over on it, and it's uncomfortable. Um, but some people are adherent. And when they are, you can see that they actually sleep better. So does that translate to better driving? How many good nights of sleep and how adherent do you have to be for how many days in a row in order to get back to normal, whatever that is? 
to your normal, or do you ever? How many days do you have to miss it to revert back to who you were? What we're beginning to find is actually the benefits of positive airway pressure accrue over months. And it takes at least three months to get as good as you can be and plateau. And whether that's actually normal is hard to say because you may actually lose some brain cells due to repeated hypoxia, due to obstructive sleep apnea, depending on how severe it is. So I'm going to go through this because I think we're a little late. And I want to just tell you that our system for instrumented vehicles deploys a bunch of boxes that are out. And we have a, 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 a web portal. Let's see if I have that. That we call Thor, where we actually get all the data and download the clips. And then we analyze them and merge all the data. So we're merging data from uh, cognitive studies, DOT data, questionnaires, uh, the remote server, from video reviews of clips. They don't analyze themselves. Um, maybe someday they will. Uh, drive files from data sets from the National Weather Service, GIS. And we merge them all together to, and clean up the data to actually address our goals and hypotheses in our study. Hopefully, we publish papers. We have several. And our ultimate goal, and this is a good place to talk about that, because we have Umtree here, but you also have a wonderful medical institution, is to merge all this information from transportation, from smart homes and communities, from hospitals, from external information on the location of a subject, to actually get new phenotypes of behavior that we wouldn't have otherwise. So we have it from transportation. We have it from health. So we actually could tell how a person with Alzheimer's disease is doing in the real world over time, or with Parkinson's disease, or with obstructive sleep apnea. They might even be able to be the potential to relate these new genotypes that take into account behavior in everywhere to medical uh, interventions, to drug therapy, to progression of disease, and even to maybe genetic factors that tell you, you know, why people do what they do and uh, where they do it over time. So this is kind of exciting. So it's blending medicine and transportation. And it's going to have to take advantage of uh, new techniques for evaluating drinking from the fire hose of data. So naturalistic data sets can be huge. And here at Michigan, you know that better than anybody. So Dr. Swetman can tell you all about that. Putting it all together means synchronizing the data streams. And then you need new data analysis strategies, uh, data mining, machine learning, pattern recognition, uh, symbolic approximation analysis, print principal component analyses, the same kind of approaches that are used to leverage data from a neuroimaging need to be put on, on these data. There are data storage and confidentiality issues, and we're discovering them. And there are all kinds of ethical issues that come out. And we hear about them every day on the, on the news. Um, this was on my mind, and I wanted to mention it to you as a real-world application of simulation. So the FDA wants to evaluate drugs. And one that they have been evaluating lately is an orexin inhibitor, which basically uh, stimulates, it, it inhibits the mechanism that stimulates wakefulness. Theoretically, this is less sedating than a sedative. <clears throat> so the, the findings in the data to data that this drug is effective for sleep, but not particularly safe at the higher doses at which it was studied. There could be daytime somnolence, which was severe and sudden. Not all patients are reliably aware of the impairment, that so-called anosognosia that I mentioned to you before. And even if they're aware, they may drive. They may have to. They may have to go to work. They may have to go to the doctor. They may not have a, a choice. So the FDA wants to consider actual and not just ideal use in the real world. And so one of the things I mentioned to you before is that drugs that lots of people take, and lots of people take multiple drugs, can have effects that accrue over time. So these are uh, somnolence events occurring after the start of a drug. And you can see that they can begin 
weeks later, and they can persist for many weeks, maybe, maybe a year. That's 450 days. And there may be a hangover effects of drugs where if you take a drug, it builds up over time, and whereas you were not sleepy at first, maybe eventually you become sleepy. So it's an important problem in drug evaluation. You know, a attack that um, industry would take or that the FDA would take, or any sensible person would take, is to use the least invasive and simplest way of measuring impairment. And one measure that has become quite uh, popular is standard deviation of lane position. So how much does somebody jiggle in a lane, and is that related to safety? Well, SDLP is a, a convenient method. It depends on visual motor control. But in a way, it doesn't link directly to key factors that are involved in driving, like executive functioning. There's a paucity of link. Remember I talked about the need to link different, um, different platforms? So there are not very many links to driver errors, to car crashes, or safety outcomes in naturalistic driving. SDLP doesn't take into account driver exposure, like mileage, traffic, weather, and so on. Many patterns of driving, whether they're safe or unsafe, can lead to a given SDLP. An SDLP that differs from average or median is not necessarily unsafe. So the point I want to make is that it would be great to have one convenient measure, but you have to avoid observational bias where you search for only where the looking is easiest, as in this sort of lamppost effect. So what conclusions can we make besides that I wasn't able to show you a bunch of neat videos? It's that results using controlled laboratory tests, and there are multiple tests, they are cognitive tests, driving simulators, and instrumented vehicles can help specify linkages between functional impairments. And these are attention, perception, cognition, motor control, and emotion and safety errors, and crash risk, which, which comes from multiple sources, self-report, state records of crashes and citations, or black boxes in drivers who we see at this institution and others with medical disorders. By understanding the patterns of driver safety errors, we may be able to design interventions. And they can be driver monitoring devices in a car, collision warning systems, drug dosing regimens, education, that will reduce these errors. The results of simulator studies can help standardize assessment of fitness to drive. There are many scenarios that you can drive uh, in that can give critical information like intersection incursions, car following, merging, curves, and multitasking, and many measures are available, not just, say, SDLP. Simulators can be deployed in clinical trials, as I just showed you, uh, to evaluate in-vehicle devices or drugs. Uh, before they're deployed on the road or before drivers get on the road, uh, to train drivers with medical disorders in the aftermath of illness and prepare them for return to driving. And predictions of driver safety and crash from driving simulation outcome measures are important, but understanding them depends on what really happens in the real world in terms of patterns of real world exposure, restriction, and a number of other factors. Transportation research today in simulation instrumented vehicles and uh, with black boxes provides an ideal opportunity for doing translational research according to um, multiple models, um, linking together basic science research, translation to humans, to patients, to practice, and to the community where people drive. So actually driving fits in NIH models of translational research in patient-oriented clinical research, in clinical trials, in community and population-based research. So what I'm saying is that driving research is actually ideally situated now to join up with medical research uh, for future investigations. We need to un understand driver theory and behavioral models better. We need standardization in what we do. Uh, I think I was talking before with Anuj on uh, 
how everybody has a different simulator and everybody has a different scenario. I think Paul Green is going to have the answer pretty soon. But we've been proposing over the last decade uh, with this uh, CARS group and the simulator users group that standardization is needed and that when you do a scenario, when you implement a scenario, you have to describe it, describe the instructions, define very closely the measures of interest, the data reduction and variable calculation, implementation variations, measurement challenges, validity, uh, and actually link your scenario to the existing data with references. So there are a lot of different directions to go in. I think this is an exciting area. I'm very glad to be asked to speak here today, and I wonder if you have any questions. No, I, say, I didn't say their driving return to normal. I said that, um, that their um, sleep improved for up to three months, and their symptoms of sleepiness reduced for up to three months. But the link between that and improvement in driving isn't as clear yet, and we're still analyzing a lot of the data that's come from the huge data set. So that's the next step of analysis. But I, what I wanted to get at is don't give up right away when you administer PAP and there's not an improvement in the first week or two weeks or three weeks, there's still the potential to improve over time. So the data that I presented are useful in a clinical sense in that they enable clinicians to know how long they should follow up, when they should schedule appointments for reevaluations, and how they should prepare patients to, uh, how they should educate patients on what to expect from their therapy. The question of whether adherence, good adherence for three months actually translates to much better driving is a different question that we haven't answered yet because we haven't analyzed all the data. Well, my, my actual question relates back to an earlier slide that you showed where you showed an uh, increase of two or more in odds ratios for patients who had obstructive sleep apnea. So my question is, were those patients uh, known to be adhering to a CPAP machine or not, or was there no, so that was a meta-analysis, and it included maybe a dozen studies. All of them performed differently, and the group with obstructive sleep apnea was a mixed bag, as it would be in a study like that. It included people with a range of ages, with a range of severities of disease, likely with a range of adherence to their therapy. One of the problems with sleep apnea is that about half of people are not adherent, and some of them are adherent some of the time. The current recommendations are use it for at least four hours a night and use it every night. But, and there's actually the capacity to track that because a lot of modern machines actually have chips in them to indicate amount of usage. And Medicare and Medicaid won't reimburse a patient unless they actually show that they're using the device that Medicare and Medicaid is paying for. So that's helpful for us. But in those studies, which took place over multiple years, all those data were not available. I'd say both. So sometimes when we've studied people in an instrumented vehicle, we've aimed to compare the results in the simulator with the results in the instrumented vehicle. And there are so many ways you can do the comparisons. I mean, you can say, is the worst guy in the simulator on this measure, the worst guy in the instrumented vehicle on this measure? Um, do people with this disease or this impairment have more trouble on this scenario in the simulator as opposed to in the instrumented vehicle? The study in obstructive sleep apnea is not doing simulation. Um, the first study did, the one that I showed you people in the sim, but that's different from the, stu the second study that I showed you, which is driving in the real world. So, there, so 
the goal of studying using instrumented vehicles in the real world or black boxes was to actually get closer to the ground truth and to get, get at issues like self-exposure to risk in drivers who might not be aware of their risk. We don't know that just by studying people in a simulator. So there's no connection in that particular study. Yeah, and that's a huge question too. It's a, you'd think it would be easy. I was coming at this from medicine. I thought the engineers would have had it all figured out. Boy, did I learn. <laughs> but it's actually it's, it's a very fertile area for research. Yeah. People are learning more and more about simulation. Simulation is pervading much beyond driving simulation. I mean, anesthesiologists are using it. Uh, students are using it to learn the physical examination. Um, it's, uh, it's being used to desensitize people with uh, PTSD who uh, maybe were exposed to horrible situations in the, in the Middle East uh, during wartime. Just recently about um, simulations being used for phantom pain. Uh, right. So it is a really broad topic, and I would say that <clears throat> we have to adhere, we have to respect or consider the same issues in driving simulation that those other applications have to. And they're questions of transfer from simulation to the real world. There's a question of you know, what exactly you compare. Um, and then there are all kinds of issues related to the simulators themselves. And are they representing the similar scenario in the same ways? Are the video displays comparable? Are they the same size? Are the haptic displays the same? Are they triggering the same? So it's dauntingly complicated. But one can see that it's also useful. And one can see that it's also safe. And um, there are applications that are maybe not so difficult, like testing somebody after a disease to see if they at least get it when they get into a car, that they can at least show that they have the possibility of controlling a vehicle so that, well, maybe I, from this I can see that I can actually get to testing them on the road. So, so it's an exciting um, technology, but what we feel is that you have to sort of triangulate it on, on the truth. Simulation is only one part of the story. Um, cognition, uh, evaluating functional domains that are critical to real world tasks is important. Testing the real world task is important. And the best way to get the truth is to, cons as close as you can, is to consider all of these different sources of information. You looked at the effectiveness of autonomous driver awareness systems on impaired drivers, and does that actually improve their driving ability even more than a non-impaired driver, or any Well, that's kind of what we're up to now with the CSRC. And so uh, <clears throat> drivers who are impaired are more likely to miss things on the road. They're less likely to respond to threats effectively or promptly. And then so you would think that if you would warn them with the same warning systems that you would uh, use the sort of one size fits all model that they would benefit. So, so far so good, but the reason to test this is that uh, somebody who has limited cognitive capacity might actually be distracted by another cue or signal in the vehicle, by a visual cue or a haptic cue, or they might misinterpret it and respond inappropriately. Or they might fail to recognize that there's a false positive or a false negative and slavishly respond to the system, whereas somebody who is maybe more aware would also be aware that the system itself might sometimes mislead them and be prepared to override it. So these are research questions that we're, we're trying to address, and it's a really important area for research. So Matt, may I ask a question? Yes. What is the best evidence, um, or what convinces you that the use of the driving simulator is not a case of the lamppost syndrome? Well, I would say that we actually have some evidence that performance in the simulator, in some respects, is similar to performance on the road. Um, there's face validity of it, you know, when you know that somebody who is impaired in the real world based on 
say, crash data or some complaint from uh, you know, the, the state, they got a, a moving citation, tend to perform worse. I mean, it depends on who they are. Um, so, I mean, there's evidence that driving simulators do have some value. We know that they're safe. Um, do they reflect exactly what's going on in the real world? I, I, I doubt it. I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe that's the best I can do. What we actually did was to make an overall uh, variable of performance in the, in the simulator that we called siren stat, which combined performance on a number of scenarios plus lane control, and we added together T-scores from these various outcomes and had a composite measure. And we compared it with a composite measure in the real world in the instrumented vehicle, and we found okay correlation, which indicates to us that what's going on in the simulator is similar to what's going on in the real world. But there are a lot of other things to explain, too. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he went to some pain to, to say that we can't assume that the simulator is the same as, as the real world. So um, do we understand where it differs and where it's the same, where it's very similar? Are we able to explain I, I, that? Uh, well, so where is it different? Well, in ours, it's clearly different in terms of motor cues. We have a static simulator. Uh, the visuals are clearly different, but they're more close to what's going on in the real world than the motion uh, cues are. Um, vision is really complicated. There are so many cues to where things are in the environment. Things like motion parallax, size, interposition of near on far, uh, optic flow gradients, and there might be cues that we're not even aware of. Um, so that, uh, you know, I think it's probably even the most perfect screen on a retinal display with a depiction of a real world scene, it's probably not quite right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's closer than motion is. Auditory is, is, is probably pretty good, mm -hmm. you know, and easier to um, simulate. So I'd say that motion is the most difficult. And even in a simulator that has you know, a, a motion, a 13 degree of freedom motion base half the size of a football field. There are obvious differences from the real world and you still need washout algorithms when the simulator reaches its limits of excursion. So that's different from the real world. Mm -hmm. So obviously the visual part is very, very critical. The visual part is critical. And then there's the other part of it, which is the sort of the cognitive part of it. So even if you have the best visuals. And even if you had a perfect motion base, I think simulating a situation that a person is likely to encounter the real, in the real world requires some thought. And so that, you know, whether something looks real, like, you know, I would never encounter something, no one would ever do that in the real world, there's that. So we put a lot of thought into what other cars do and how they do it. So there's, I don't know what you call it, it's like sort of a cognitive validity. And it doesn't have to do with, it's, it's, it's construct validity really is what it is. And it doesn't have to do with exactly how it looks, but it, and it doesn't have to do with exactly how it feels because of the motion base, but it's a real situation that I really would encounter. So we work a lot on that. You mentioned as a uh, practicing clinician, you know, you, you, you see patients that say, yes, I'm a good driver, and their families behind them are saying no. Do you see a time when you might use a simulator to close that gap uh, for, the, for the patient? Yeah, yes. And so, you know, uh, and we've done that. So, for example, you saw that picture, that still picture I showed of the guy with the homonymous hemianopia. Well, he wanted to still drive. And he had, besides the visual problem, he had a number of cognitive problems. So we had him drive in the simulator. One of the issues with simulation is you would love it to be a test that actually is a medical test that would be treated like any other test and is reimbursable. We found it impossible to do that. I don't know why. You know, it's, it's a Medicare and Medicaid is not interested. Although OTs are actually able to do driving simulator uh, tests and get them paid and they tend to be on 
very low fidelity simulators, and I don't even know what they're testing. And I don't know why that's better for CMS than the kind of more detailed, more thoughtful, I think, stuff that we're doing. But so yes, but we can use that information to close the loop and to present the data to the patient and to the family and say, look, we know it's not real, but look, he can't even keep the car on the road, or he didn't even notice this car coming, he like crashed through five of them. Thank God they made it out of you know, electronic vapor. Nothing happened. But can't you see how this would be a problem in the real world? So yes, we can use that kind of information to close the loop. We could also use that kind of information to open the loop in that I think it's possible to train somebody and familiarize them with situations where they might get in trouble following a disease and in recovery to prepare them to get back on the road. So we can close the loop and we can open the loop. Boy, you know, you mean like a simulator? Well, you're talking about training, get somebody back on the road. So I think a simulator is helpful to actually see if somebody can get in a car, situate themselves, operate the controls, keep the control of the vehicle reasonably on the road, respond reasonably to what would appear to be real world challenges. Does that guarantee that they will be a good driver on the road? No, but it actually maybe will give you the confidence to go to the next level, which might be to send somebody to a state certified driving evaluator and have them check out a person on the road. Um, as far as training, I, I think it depends on who it is that you train, and it depends on what kind of deficits they have. I think that we would have people with executive function problems and try to train them. I think we, we hardly ever get anywhere with them, particularly on people who have anosognosia because they don't know that they have problems. They don't respond to training. They don't believe it. And it looks like they don't care. And so, for example, training somebody who has, say, a right parietal lesion and left hemi neglect and then doesn't even know that they have a left side of their body, but they recover a little bit and say they have a little bit of left hemiparesis, I would be very concerned about that person getting on the road. I would think no matter how, no matter how much you would train them, they would never get better. Another example would be Alzheimer's disease. What we know is it's a disease with progressive impairment. And so you get to a point where even if you train them, it's very unlikely, even if they show some sort of procedural learning effect, which we know they can demonstrate. For example, you can have them use a pursuit rotor and show that this sort of procedural learning improves over time and that they retain it for days. But what's that got to do with driving? Probably some aspects of it have to do with driving but not critical aspects. And I doubt you could train them in a way that they would get back on the road, and they're gonna get worse anyhow. Same thing for a person with Huntington's disease. But there might be certain patients with stroke, who have strokes that are not in the right parietal lobe, that may be in the occipital lobe, and they lose vision, but they learn strategies for accommodating to their visual loss by scanning differently. Maybe they would learn in a simulator. So I think it's a complicated answer to a complicated question that's deceptively simple. Seems deceptively simple. Thanks, Matt. Th thanks, everybody. Um, it's been fascinating to hear your view of, a uh, unique view in some ways, of medical research and how it's impacting on driving in so many different ways now and how that comes together with these big data sets. So, Matt, that was. Uh, a great contribution. We know that you travelled a lot, not only travelled a long way, you travelled a long way in, in the winter weather and of uh, course we always allow people to have more PowerPoints when, when they do that, so <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Um, I think the other challenge we have is, and we touched on it with the fact that we can't get broad acceptance of the uh, simulator test as something that ought to be reimbursable, just the whole policy interface with, with this kind of research and understanding. Um, interesting example I've been involved in here at the University of Michigan the last couple of months on um, winter weather closing policy for the university. The university had never closed uh, before January this year. 
uh, for classes, that is. And the concepts of risk, exposure, self-regulation, uh, very hard to implement in, in that kind of environment because everyone's got a different understanding of what risk actually means and, and can you actually get to a point of quantifying what, even what winter weather driving risk might be, how much it's elevated um, and what the exposure to that might be. Interestingly enough, uh, this university creates uh, about a million miles of exposure every day. So the numbers start, start to add up. So we always need to remember all those different di dimensions and I really thank you and your colleagues for all the great work you're doing to help us explain these things much more simply because we need to do that. Uh, so again, please join me in thanking Matt Rizzo for a great presentation. Thank you. And don't forget those that want to get a deal on the Connected Vehicle Symposium, see Francine. Uh, she's sitting near the door there on the way out. And come and join us uh, for the reception, uh, again hosted by Toyota. We uh, appreciate that and we can continue to chat with Matt. Thank you for coming. Sorry about those videos. You'd have loved them. Thanks, Chuck. Sorry about that. I don't know why they didn't work. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry.